So welcome to the Frictionless Journey, part of the Transformers track. Thank you. And my name is Steve Rogers. I'm with a company called Javi. We're a food service retail and convenience industry partner. For 45 years now, Javi has been supporting brands like BP, Shell, McDonald's, and Chick-fil-A through our supply chain analytics and logistics services around the world. I want to hand the mic over real quick to my friend, Nick Peters. Nick, if you could introduce yourself real quick. Sure, my name's Nick Peters. Everybody hear me okay? Just want to make sure. All right, we're good there, all right. So my name is Nick Peters. I'm the IT director for Holmes Oil Company in a little town of Chapel Hill, North Carolina. And uh, I'm going to kick it back over to you. I don't want to steal your show. No. <laughs> you, you, he, I, I might be the, the warm up. I'm the warm up band, really. This is the show. This is the guy who's don't actually do out there, don't, don't out do there, it. out there in the, in, the, in the thick of things, implementing this stuff. So, yes, I've just set you up, brother. Fair enough. All fair right. Enough. Let's, let's get rolling here. So, uh, so we've already done our introductions. Here we are, our, our, our beautiful mugs, so to speak. And what are we going to learn? We're going to learn about friction. We're going to learn, so why are we here being fr frictionless? And what is it and why does it matter? Who's taking on friction heads on in their business? How do you develop a new customer experience? And then ultimately, so friction, what's the big deal about this? We need friction to stop our cars, right? Friction's a good thing for certain situations. Friction is great when we're freezing outside and we're creating friction, right? That's all good. Not so much in retail. Uh, ultimately, I, I think it comes down to one word. Friction sucks for everybody in retail, right? <laughs> it, it doesn't work. Our customers hate it. it re, it's, it's all about waiting. It's all about not getting through the line as quickly as I possibly can, not being able to transfer from one platform to another when I'm, when I'm on the web or going to a mobile or go, going mobile or going into a store. It's these, these little places along the way that keep me from getting to my purchase and getting me on my way. So these, these all, this whole idea of friction, yes, it sucks for everyone, customers, employees, store managers, franchisees, brands, we know it's, 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 it's tough for, for folks to deal with it. So when we look at frictionless then and now, so it was a few years back before smartphones, you know, frictionless is a pretty, pretty new thing for us to be thinking about, but, uh, when you look at frictionless then, it was, you know, th you know the things like, you know, pay at the pump, you know, that was really, that's kind of a frictionless thing to do. It was, uh, you know, cashless transactions. Hey, you know, we didn't have to pay for cash or something. We actually can use something else like a credit card. It was store layouts. It was like, you know, but all about, you know, some of the more obvious things. But beyond that, we're now looking at a very different experience for our customers, for the folks that go, go to our stores every day. It's speed. <laughs> personalization, anticipation of needs, one-click purchasing, and so on. It's paying with my iPhone now because for some reason it's too hard for me to take my wallet out and take my credit card and swipe it. I thought that was the most ridiculous thing in the world when they said they came up with Apple Pay. You just pull your phone out. Guilty as charged. I do it all the time now because I've just saved 10 seconds. But for some reason, I just get a rise out of pulling my phone out because you know what? It's already in my hand. I know it's already in my hand when I'm walking through the store. It's always in my hand. It just happens to be over there right now because it'll disturb me during my presentation. However, it is typically sewn to my hand and there I am purchasing with it. Those, those are frictionless experience that we're just taking for granted now. Um, it's scribbling something on a tablet with your finger that looks like a kindergartner's masterpiece but it's actually just your signature. Remember the first time you did that and how precise you were going to get your name just exactly right when you were signing on that tablet. And then you, when you did it really fast years later, you found that it looked exactly the same, kind of like an EKG, or at least my EKG, it kind of just looks like this. And no one knows that that's my signature. But as far as the retailer is concerned, as far as the bank is concerned, you've agreed to the transaction and we're on our way. So that's th those are some of those frictionless things that we're starting to see more and more. Um, and now I'm only the, uh, now it's when we're going beyond the, what we think about it, where are our customers thinking about it? They're thinking about it in a high expectations perspective. It's about an ideal shopping experience. Ideal. That's the key word on this slide. A couple of uh, perspectives from, from surveys that, that have been run from uh, Alliance data as an example. Alliance is finding that 76% of customers are giving you three strikes and you're out. That's how they're thinking about this frictionless experience. They're looking at three chances for them to have a, a, a ideal shopping experience. 
almost half of them, 43% of them are saying that this is one of their top reasons why they're going to leave a brand. They're going to say, you know, you're, it, half the time or close, close to it, I'm going to leave a brand for good because of my poor experience with that brand. It doesn't mean, that necessarily mean in the store either. It's online, it's mobile. So what else, are, what else is the market saying to us? I could read through this, but I'll tell you in one word. It's about waiting. Waiting, waiting, waiting. We all love to wait. That's, if I look at one word and frictionless, and what do I try to pull that together? It's all about waiting. Waiting to check out. Waiting, which, ch which, which affects my shopping behavior. I put something back. Okay, there's a chance I might pick something up. There's a good chance 20% of folks will abandon their, sh their cart altogether if they're waiting too long. Uh, internet users are saying, you know, scan and go. If you're, if you're familiar with Amazon Go as an example, and you're going to hear a lot more about that later from, from Nick in, in, in scan and go environments with Skip and Go Skip, you'll have a, uh, you'll, they, those users are saying that half the time they're saying, yeah, that's, gonna, that's, a, that's an experience I want. That's something I'm looking for. And this just isn't a U.S. thing. I did that Ola routine for, for good reason. Obviously, to welcome folks from outside of the U.S., that was from the heart, but more from, from the mind is that this is, this is an international issue. UK, UK as well, as an example, retailers, complaints are all about stock availability, things that I was expecting to be on shelf. Waiting time again, waiting, 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 and store congestion. These are the th this is what the market is telling us. Frictionless experience framework. I'm gonna walk you through a framework, seven items to take you through. And the, th and the key takeaway here, I'd like you to, to walk away today is that you don't need to be perfect at everything here. And you'll find that some leaders like the Amazons and the Apples that we're all very familiar with are not perfect at all of these. In fact, they choose a couple of places to play and play well to their brand's advantage and to serve the customers that are most important to them and to growing their brand. So ease of access, this is the elapsed time from contact to payment. These are, th this is a, a framework that the, uh, at, at Global Data that where they put a frictionless shopping retail study together and came up with these, these seven items, this ease of access, this whole idea of about the time it takes from how long does it take from a time for a customer to interact with your brand or your store to the time of purchase and really understanding what that is. Fulfillment. When we think of fulfillment, the one, the one that comes to mind for me is, and for many of us in the room, is an Amazon as an example. Fulfillment are the, are the goods available. Are they in stock? Are they on store shelves? Are they ready for delivery? Are they ready for shipment? Do you offer free shipping or some type of consolidated or alternative shipping to reduce costs? This is this whole idea of a frictionless framework from a fulfillment perspective. Multi-channel alignment. I talked about this a little bit earlier about how customers engage with our brands now and our stores. It's not just walking in the front door. It's not in the forecourt. It is mobile. It is on the web. And how well do those platforms interact with one another as I'm interacting with a food order potentially on my mobile? And how does that experience translate when I walk into the store to get my product that I ordered potentially five or even only two minutes ago? And being able to do that as seamlessly as you possibly can. Another area is payment options. We look at payment options, you know, this is, you know, you name it. Now this, this world in convenience, we still have a significant amount of cash transactions, but we know payment options are, are, are important to us. Credit cards, obviously, but new, new names that weren't even around only a few years ago. Venmo, Zelle, Apple Pay, all of these different platforms that when we, when in back in the good old days, it was cash and credit cards, all these different platforms that we now have to interact with and ensure that, that we're being able to offer those different payment options to our customers. Personalization, how well do you know your customer? Your customer wants, you, wants to be known by you. They want to be treated like they're the only customer in the world and how well are you personalizing and making that ideal, there's that word again, ideal and special shopping experience for them. Positive friction. I just said earlier about how much friction sucks. There's one caveat to that, and I'm going to dig deeper on this whole idea of positive friction in a moment. But these are purposely placed pauses in the process to ensure 
that the shopping experience is enhanced by those pauses. We'll do a little bit de deeper dive in that momentarily. Uh, and then finally, this whole idea of security, this transparency and security housing of data. This is a pretty darn hot topic. It has been for a while. Um, it's, uh, you, you think, you think of what you're agreeing to when you're downloading and using that app. Uh, it's, it's highly unregulated right now. Many times in, in the fine print, your personal data, name, location, purchases, searches, and so on, will be used and shared. Uh, if you'd like to get the, the scary version of that, um, there's, a, there's, there's a great uh, Netflix show called The Great Hack on the whole idea of Cambridge Analytics. That's a pretty interesting um, uh, documentary, about 90 minutes long or so, if you want to understand of how data is uh, potentially being used to, uh, to drive behaviors. I'll just leave it at that. Just uh, to give you an idea of, how, of what you're signing up for when you accept to download that app and how your data is being used. It's in the fine print. Um, now, regulations are coming in place. I know Europe is further ahead on this uh, with, with, their, with their sharing laws, and I know some of the frustrations that that's created around the globe, but there's good reasons behind that. So back to this whole idea of positive friction. What, what is this all about? When we look at it, this is about adding to the experience, creating positive moment or friction or a pause. Retailers can use this to their advantage to somewhat slow the process down just a little bit to drive a better engagement with, with, the, with the customer. I, call, I like to call it like kind of like a, a dash or a pause in the, in the process. So what do, what do we see as different versions or different ideas around positive friction? An intervention, this understands your buying pa patterns and behaviors to suggest products or, or recalls previous times you've been to the website, previous times you've been to the store, previous times you've been on the mobile to identify what your buying behaviors are and potentially call up compl complementary products or previous preferences. Verification. This is the, um, I like to call this, are you sure you want to buy this button? Uh, one of my favorite ones is that when you're on the airfare w and whenever you're buying airfare and you're about to buy the, the $2,500 for the five of you to go to Disney World and you go, oh my God, I can't believe $2,500 here goes. And, and you do it and he's like, oh, there's one more step. And that's, I like to call it the are you sure step. It's deliberate because there are folks that are out there potentially rushing through the process and being able to look at that and say, you know what, I put the wrong date in there. Oh, I'm so glad I didn't go through the, through the entire purchase. It brings the entire purchase right back up. Take, it one, take, a, take a look at it one more time. Is that, is that, the, is that right? Because the airlines know they're, you're going to realize it 10 seconds later. You're going to pick up the phone. And the friction it causes for them, many times, because it's within 24 hours, they'll allow you to make the change without, make, without charge but they want to avoid that charge as well. They want to avoid that friction in their system. So that's a, an example of pl purposely play placing those in there. Another place is around enhancement. This is, you know, uh, tell me more about my purchase. Educate me through the process. This is typically more big ticket items, but it doesn't have to be. In your businesses, new products is a great example of where we see where th this is about enhancement. Newer products that are coming into your businesses, being in, in the snack category or, or, or all the way into the tobacco category ev and everything in between, or in fresh food, this is allowing you to educate on a new flavor profile as an example for your fresh food uh, program. Uh, and it allows this education process. So don't just think about it as, you know, uh, as I'm stepping through this and buying, buying a car. This also applies into how you're educating your consumers, customers as they're walking in your door or how you're interacting with them mobile or on the web. A couple more points of, imp of positive friction. This is, you know, suggesting complementary products. Who's a master at this? Amazon. Again, I, I bought them up a few times. It's a, they're, they're obviously a leader in this. As you've purchased an, an item, they're saying, well, who else purchased this? And this is what they, brought, what they bought with it. And many times, they're logical complements to, the to the purchasing process. It's a component that goes well with that, with that particular purchase. And then functional. This is interesting, fr more from a deliberately slowing the process down so the, so the consumer can catch up to how fast the electronic transaction is moving. Uh, I, think of, I think of this in the, in more in some of the bulkier items that might be in a, uh, in a Costco or in a Home Depot as you're going through the process and you're potentially scanning and putting things away. Slowing that process sl uh, down slightly so 
it can go at sp the, the speed of which the human can, can move, not at the speed at which electro uh, electrical data moves. So those are some things to think about in this whole idea of positive, uh, positive friction. So who's out there? When we look at this with this from a leaders and laggards perspective, I've already mentioned a few of these names. Um, and you'll see from top to bottom in these seven areas that I've touched on the frictional exp frictionless experience, some of them are pretty obvious here on the leader side, the Apples and the Amazons, uh, Carrefour. They're, they're some of the more obvious leaders in the ease of access to their, to their products, to their stores, to their websites, to their, to their mobile apps, and potentially not so much um, uh, where, where IKEA is potentially more lagging in that area. Some other places in fulfillment, certainly Amazon, you could say, well, look at that, Apple's not there. Well, Apple isn't as easy to get products. Let's call, let's call it what it is. You have to order them online. You have to go to the store to pick them up. You, you're, you're, you may be able to get it through another outlet, like a Best Buy as an example, but they're not as easy to fulfill their products as let's say uh, an Amazon or a, uh, or a Carform or a Kroger for that matter. On the multi-channel alignment, you'll see some, some, some players up here that are not the obvious. Uh, Walmart is getting some high, high grades, Tesco getting some high grades on that being able to engage the customer in multi-platform environments. Ordering something on the mobile, being able to go to the store, being able to, uh, be able, being able to pick up product in a convenient way, product coming out to you to, uh, uh, to your car, product being, uh, being put into a forward space in the parking area so you, can you don't even have to go into the store. Walmart is, is, has already proven out this model as an example. Payment options, these, these, are, these are the areas where I've talked about you know, all the the Zells and the Venmos and the Apple Pays, these, these are areas where you know, Amazon is, um, and Carrefour are, are taking advantage of, uh, of different payment options and being able to apply that. Personalization, again, you can see this Amazon seems to be coming up a lot, but it's not just them. You look at uh, Zara as an example. Th these, are, these are folks that are really putting the effort into, this is important to us. We want to have a personal relationship with, uh, with, our, with our customers. These are the folks, this, this is the place where I'm going to place my bet in this whole idea of the frictionless experience. I want personalization to be a place that is important to me. And many times it comes down to, again, your brand, your customers, your brand message. Down to positive friction, IKEA is a master at this. What is they're taking you through the process. Heck, when you're walking through an IKEA, if you happen to have the chance, it's like walking through a maze. I mean, they, they, it's a deliberate way, and it's a deliberate path and experience. It's not just the electronics that you're taking through the store or, the, or how you're purchasing, it's how you're making decisions and how they're taking you through the process to get, to, get through your purchases. And then security, uh, you can see some of, the, some of the folks that are on the high end here, and then uh, some of the folks that are surprisingly on the low end. Um, Costco is a bit of a surprise here. Uh, unfortunately for Target, a little bit of a, uh, a poster child for the whole idea of security issues. I mean, we, we've seen that in the news, and that seems to have passed now. But this is, this is a key area where we see um, seeing as more table stakes but even if it's table stakes, then why are we still seeing laggards out there that are not potentially taking security as seriously as they should be? From the frictionless experience, I want to go into you know, who's out there. Has anybody had a chance to get to an Amazon Go store? Show of hands real quick. Mm, a few of me out there, a few of you out there. So um, very quickly, this is uh, uh, intended to be a uh, frictionless experience from the fact that you will no, not need to engage with a human being for the entire process. Now, they do have folks in the store to help you out with the process. They do have folks that will take you, take you through that. But the whole idea is that you can go in there, scan, scan your phone, enter the store, and start picking products, taking them, putting them in your basket, putting them back, back on the shelf. They're using video as well as um, shelf monitoring to facilitate, uh, facilitate the experience. Scan it one more time and you're out the door, you've, you've completely checked out. That's one of a, f of a few. Uh, Nick is going to walk us through the GoSkip app and his, his application, his experience with that, so I'll let him take, take it from there. And then something that's a little bit closer to, to what we work with every day in the world of Starbucks and McDonald's, as an example, there's, uh, you'll, you'll see you know, Starbucks, I think, m uh, I'm, I'm a personal Starbucks fan, I've got the app, order mobile, walk in, mobile for Steve, grab it and I run out the door. Um, that's just, that's, that's ubiquitous now. What's, what's, what's coming for Starbucks? They've, they've already announced that the uh, Penn Station in New York City, they're going to have a mobile-only pickup location. The store is being built very quietly, but it's made the news that you place a mobile order, 
It is only for more mobile orders. You will go to that, go to that kiosk, go to that storefront, pick up your coffee or whatever your favorite beverage may be, and you're on your way in, that, uh, in, in, um, in, in, in their version of a fric frictionless environment. For, for, for McDonald's, I can go into some, some of what they're doing. This is focused on simpl simplification in their business. This whole idea of a McDonald's to go environment or branded store. This is a no seating, kiosks only, reduced menu, all about grab and go. That this is, and you think about this, certainly ordering ahead or going through a kiosk, but the, the experience around this friction, frictionless idea is still core to their brand about efficiency about getting through the process as efficiently, efficiently as you possibly can and doing it with lower labor costs and ultimately on a, on a smaller footprint as well. Ultimately a kitchen, kiosks, and a, wait, a, and a pickup area. This is, this is basically what is being tested in the UK today. For shifting from the customer facing side of friction and frictionless, I want to take a quick shift into the whole idea of the what's sitting behind the scenes. And Nick, again, is going to get into a little bit of this as well. And this connectivity across the supply chain, which is, you know, can be accomplished with eight essential components. This is the tech. This is the network. This is the process, the people that you don't see. Sense and respond. I talked a little bit earlier about demand sensing products, video, shelf, uh, uh, shelf sensors, smart shelves. These are, these are places where demand can be sensed. The, cu the customer has grabbed an item and they've gone to checkout. That's sending a signal to the, to the back of house, to the storeroom, or ultimately to the distributor or the supplier that we need replenishment on, on these products. Those can be ganged together or can be batched together in logical components as far as truck loads or pallet loads or ultimately even individuals if that's all that's required or even, uh, or even master cartons as, a, as an example. Data synchronization, this will get more and more, more important. You're gonna hear data constantly throughout the, the, throughout the, uh, th throughout the conference and going forward, you know, data, the importance of it, access to it, the quality of data and the multiple platforms, being able to sync, those, the, sync data to understand the end-to-end -end perspective, consumption at the store to the, to the source, either the distributor or ultimately the supplier, and being able to share that data so that when you are running low, you are replenished at the right time and you're not carrying too much inventory as an example. Another component is about visualization, taking all that data and turning it into insights and saying, now what am I doing with all this data? Wonderful, I've got it. I don't know what to do with it. There are tools and platforms and, and uh, capabilities that you can extract insights from the data st to start driving visual ways to look at your buying behavior, look at your customers, look at your inventories. Logistics, this is becoming a better, potentially becoming a better partner to, to, your, to your partners, folks that are replenishing your stores every day, either through direct-to-store or in, in, other, in other ways, being able to identify cost op op optimization uh, approaches to really drive uh, turnover, drive, uh, drive replenishment, and, to, and, and ultimately get product to retail shelves on, in a timely basis. Campaign optimization. This is where we get a little fancy about Hey, we've put this campaign together as far as a promotion and something's not working right. We're ending up with too much inventory. In the past it was, well, let's move it somewhere else. That's an expensive proposition. Maybe not move it somewhere else. Do we need to shape demand differently? Do we need to look at pricing differently on the fly in the campaign and say, if we reduce the price, will, will we slow down sales? I'm sorry, increase sales, or do we increase the price in order to slow down sales, being able to manipulate the demand side of the equation potentially, and not so much the supply side of the equation. Another one is digitization. This is an interesting one around really testing yourself how well you are at, at pulling friction out of the process. Can you put sensors in line with, uh, throughout your supply chain in store or outside of the store to understand where people are getting held up in the process? Are they spending too much time in front of a case or in front, uh, in, inside of a, a, a near a display? From, from the moment they walk in to the moment they've purchased, we talked about that earlier, about that ease of, uh, ease of engagement. This digitization process helps measure how quickly they're getting through the process and where the friction is, or those, or those uh, gates that they're being held up at is, is what digitization is all about. 
Mass customization, this is back to the point on the, the, this, this point of really knowing who your customer is. And this isn't just for, just for expensive cars and, and jewelry. This is, this, is, this is the world that is coming more and more prevalent in the world of convenience, this whole idea of made to order, especially in the fresh food category, especially in any of the food categories that you potentially are looking at or already in. Made to order is, is where, where that would, would drive home mass customization for the for the industry. And then ultimately user experience. How are you being able to get to a better experience for your customers, giving them that ability to provide feedback, being able to, uh, to take that feedback and turn it into a more quality experience. I know we've covered a lot here. I think I'm right on time to hand it right over to, to, to Nick. I'm going to shift right over to Nick. All it's right. all you as my friend, and uh, we'll take questions at the end. Fair enough. All yours. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right. So, one of the things that's pretty interesting about our situation is, um, and I don't think happens quite enough, is we're in a world where we've got all this stuff really going on pretty quickly. And um, when they asked me to do this session, I thought it was great because they wanted me to take a case study approach. And so anybody that knows me knows, quite frankly, words like candor and honesty and blunt tend to come out. So what I like to do and what I think I really benefit from is it's great to celebrate the successes with everybody. Um, but what I really want to do here is I kind of want to walk you through the example of GoSkip when we deployed this, because I want to talk about where we went right and more importantly, I think where we went wrong, because I think there's a world where um, if I can help you guys or if we can help each other figure out where our pitfalls are, I definitely think it helps with uh, making adoption and standardization much better. So. I'm going to take you guys along for the cruiser's journey, if you will. And um, we're pretty excited. We just, as you can see here, um, we got the whole cruiser's thing going here. We just went through a rebranding process of this, and we're pretty pumped about the concept. But um, just as a follow-up, we are 26 stores. We are located in uh, Chapel Hill, North Carolina. We celebrate two fuel brands, major oil fuel brands. And we have stores located in uh, rural, I can never say that word. I struggle with it, in urban markets. And one of the reasons why it seems like a benign point, but one worth noting is it does go to consumer behavior. And so I am going to touch about this in a few minutes, but I do just wanted to call out to that point. So one of the things that we try to do is when we're evaluating our solutions, we figure out implementation process wise, what we need to do, how we're going to get it out there. And then we try to theorize where we're going to have problems at. Sometimes we win, sometimes we lose. And um, so this is just an exercise um, that we go through. And so I wanna call back out to the example of 26 stores. It's me and one other person on our IT team. And so it gives me a unique insight because I still go to the field and do installations and fun stuff like that. And I'm also the guy that designs the back end stuff and makes it all talk and helps it all happen. And, and so one of the things that I'm hypersensitive to is that implementation process, because sometimes the technology looks so cool and looks so awesome and so great. And then you go to implement this thing and it's just like, oh man, I didn't realize this was that tough. And so then there's a go to market. Um, the go to market approach is, yeah, we've got this really cool, neat technology, but does it fit where we're trying to go with this? And lastly, now we've got this thing going here, and uh, well, here's where we tripped up at. So again, some of the questions we kind of go through mindset-wise. So how does this help us differentiate from our competitors? And I think, obviously, when we're talking in a world of consumer experience, and we're trying to uh, make candid comments like, everybody sells the same Mountain Dew, um, I think that is a very important question to ask ourselves. And we're just trying to create a world where our customers not only like us, but love us. And uh, going back to the Apple comment earlier, I think those guys have obviously amongst other brands figured that out really well. And so is there a market need for it? And so I do think that that can segue into two points when it comes to a market need. A market need can be something that we think the customer is going to want in the future, or obviously we're in a situation where the market's been screaming for it for a while and we're trying to catch up. And I'll reference the example that Steve made um, where we're just trying to figure out situations to solve common day problems. Why is this friction so tough for us? Why do we have to sit here for 10 minutes waiting for a transaction to kick out and so forth? And then another note is 
if you're willing to do something like this, because just keep in mind here, this is a transformer track, right? So you gotta have a little risk here. And the risk in this situation is adopting cutting edge technology. And I'm gonna call on that point in a little bit too. But it's worth noting, the words cutting edge awful, uh, also uh, correlate to bleeding edge. And so that's where the risk comes in. And at a simple note, does it actually fit our branding initiatives, right? So cool technology is great, but if it's counterproductive to what we're trying to sell our consumer, it's pointless. So when we're talking about testing and deployment, these are the things we look at. And when we look at them, um, one of the things that we're trying to figure out is, we're trying to go through this process with, okay, is this cool, is this great? Okay, great. So we're environment adoption requirements. So technology is an amazing thing. We've got cloud platforms, we've got secured internal clouds, we've got local on-prem still. There's a lot of options available to us now. So whereas five, 10 years ago, there was a really um, stringent, very tight situation where we had very limited options as to what we were trying to do, um, cloud platforms have really opened us up to have the capabilities of doing these different things. The trick here is, is consumer, right? So converging technologies. So mobile and loyalty, when I talk to our customers, right? they don't necessarily see the difference. And so when you get into a world where you're trying to converge a loyalty platform, a mobile platform, a frictionless checkout platform, and oh, by the way, you've got payment rails you've got to figure out here too, right? You may have some gift card action here. There's all these complexities that come to the situation that the consumer doesn't most of the time want to take the time to even figure it out. They just want clean, simple, go, right? Security implications, I, uh, I think that one speaks for itself. Um, today's day and age, I think it's worth noting, I think it's worth talking about, and I think we need to be candid and honest with ourselves about what we do right and what we do wrong. Standards adoption, um, this is my shameless plug for Conexus. Um, if anybody is not members, I highly recommend you go check out their booth at NAX. Um, Conexus is a standards body for the convenience store industry that works really well with NAX. And uh, we fight really hard to try to standardize interfaces and platforms and APIs and uh, XML schemas and things like that. And to realize that the reason for those benefits is for things like scalability. So scalability is great because worth noting, um, scalability creates a situation where you can have five stores, you can have 500 stores, and if the solution is robust and standards in place, it doesn't matter. And so it's also worth noting that when we're talking about scalability, smaller retailers sometimes have had quite a hurdle to overcome. And they've gotten into a situation where they don't want to adopt technologies or they just flat out can't because the solution is so complicated. It takes customization, it takes a lot of manpower. And so scalability with all these other attributes kind of lined up really does help a situation for even a small retailer of one or two stores to implement some of these things. So, Again, for the third time here, we, we decided to use GoSkip in this situation. And so for this case study, we use GoSkip. And this is some of the advertisement we did. So we've got some iPads at the front door. We've got some uh, signs out at the door. We've got flyers that we've made out. And so this is some of the communication that we've done. I was just on the last, uh, last session and I really did appreciate when he said, employees matter. Do not forget this. I understand we are in a world where we are trying to optimize our labor. I understand. But if these people do not buy in, pack it up. They have to be bought in on this. They have to believe in this. And keep in mind, you know, we have the fortunate opportunity to come here and talk with industry leaders and talk with other people in the same circles and all that. You know, sometimes a CSR, all they see is a post. Walmart eliminating jobs, robotics everything. And don't get me wrong, I'll sit up here all day long and preach to you guys efficiencies and preach to you guys automation because I'm a big fan of it. But just like any other program where we're trying to create an experience, these guys matter, and ladies for that matter. So. We like to have fun with this. I put some goofy pictures in there for a reason because sometimes we just don't take ourselves too seriously. Um, anyway, 
So we took an interesting approach of, we wanted to roll this out to the employees first, okay? So we wanted them to beat up on it. We wanted them to brutalize it. We wanted us to tell, be candid with us and tell us everything that's wrong. Hindsight, that was a little bit more than what I thought I could handle, but um, you know, it's, it was all right, it was okay. Um, they were very candid with me, which is a great thing. So um, we got the employees taken care of and we said, hey guys, what do you think? Do we think we can make this work? And they say, yeah, sort of, okay. Well, what's the sort of part? We'll get to that. So we took a friends and family approach, like I said earlier. And so one of the first rub points that we ran into is, is how do we create a message to communicate this to the customer? So this is a completely new platform, something we've never done before, and a little bit more background. So again, we're major oil, but we don't have our own in-house loyalty program. So for us, this almost represents a version of a loyalty platform. So we're trying to figure out how to communicate this yet still be good partners to our major oil platforms, right? And so figuring out that quick and concise message, because, oh, by the way, they're still trying to sell stuff too, right? Because at the end of the day, all we're trying to do here is sell more Snickers bars. So we got to figure out a way to cleanly and quickly communicate this message. The good news is, is when people use this solution, oh, it's sticky. It's great. It's fun. It's easy. It's clean. Um, and so those are some of the positive points of that. And that's worth noting because the hurdle is not people continuing to use the app. The hurdle is obviously people using the app for the first time. And so we're trying to build the unique experience. Now, now here comes the other fun part of this. And this is the part where I show you guys, hey, here, here's where I kind of peel back the curtain. And I kind of say, you know, these are some struggles we had. Um, so, the ever iconic Ricky Bobby over there. I love that guy. I watched that movie last week. It was fantastic. Anyway, okay. So first and foremost, or customer employee reluctance. So one of the things that I took pride in is the fact that I actually went to probably half of our stores over the first few weeks that we implemented this solution. And I took a couple of minutes and I just asked some consumers for some questions. And if you're wanting to know, yes, I absolutely, absolutely bribed them with a fountain or a coffee and all that for taking their time and all that. But I just wanted to get some feedback here. And so the thing that I ran into is what's up on the screen right now. So people, while I do agree that there are people that are willing to give up some personal information to create a unique experience, I think recent history has caused some situations where it causes people to not trust technology. And so specifically in mobile apps and things like that. So they are very concerned about what you know, right? I want you to, and, and it's this interesting balance. I want you to know enough to make my experience great, but I don't want you to know too much. I, I don't want you to know that I buy orange juice every two days, right? And so we really try to figure out a world where we're trying to be transparent with our customer. And that's, that's the thing that I did not put on the slide that's worth noting. Be transparent with your customer. I understand that there's GDPR out there and there's these regulations out there where we're required to, but be honest with your consumers. Tell them why you want to do this. And you know, and it's interesting, it's pretty refreshing when they come back and say, oh, okay, well, we understand that. I can buy off on that. So they don't wanna link their credit card numbers. They don't want their personal information out there. They don't want their pinnacle identifier, which would I believe to be the banking info, right? So we're really challenged to try to get them to overcome all these hurdles and say, hey, trust us, come on in, it's good, it's good, we got you covered. So the other side of this is the awkward feeling with a new shopping experience. And so I had a couple of colleagues of mine go in and shop the experience. And one of the interesting things that he came back with right off the bat was, it's an awkward feeling. Excuse me, what do you, what do you mean awkward? Nick, it's weird. Well, why is it weird? Okay, well, here's why. When I live in a world where I go to a Walmart self-checkout and there's a camera in my face, I live in a world when I go to a Sam's Club and they check my receipts, I live in a world when I look up and I see 58 cameras watching every move I make, now you're trying to tell me you trust me to just walk in, get what I want, scan it with your phone, walk out, now all of a sudden you trust me. It really is an awkward experience. 
And so the interesting thing about the Amazon Go in, in contrast to this is, the Amazon Go, there's still um, visible deterrence, right? You still walk into there and you still scan your phone and then you walk out, you're, you're still going through the turn styles and all that, right? Well, with us, it's completely different. You can literally walk in, grab what you want, scan on your phone and walk out. You can engage with our team, which we would love for you to do. Or if you're in a hurry, you can roll right on out. It doesn't really matter. But, but it is an awkward experience because we have trained consumer behavior in such a way where it's like, well, hold on a second here. I know we taught you guys that, but we, we don't mean this now. So, and I definitely think that again, being transparent and candid with your customers and saying, hey guys, you know what? We're trying to do things differently here. We're trying to make the experience unique and we're trying to do what's best for you guys. Another thing that's worth noting here is as technology evolves, there is still a hurdle of unbanked consumers. It's a big number, right? And we're in a world where with all the political grandstanding that's going on right now, which I won't get into, it's, it's tough for people to trust banks right now. And so there is still a situation where we have plenty of unbanked customers. And so the question that we asked ourselves is, is can, can we cater to them at any level with this type of a solution? The answer is right now, no. So again, just being with, candid with the honesty here, we're, we want to figure out a way to handle the situation with unbanked consumers and all that, but it really is a challenge for us. And tech is not a one size fits all approach. So we've adopted GoSkip, we've adopted this self frictionless checkout where people can use their phones and all that. Um, we also recognize that not every one of our customers wants to do it, okay. So, you know, is there a world in cruisers land that is a world of, you know, we still have the traditional checkout, we still have the traditional CSR experience as we call it. Sure, there's also a world where, you know what? Hey, guess what guys, you know what? We can also do a self checkout. More atypical response, the, the, the Walmart feeling, the, the Harris Teeters of the world, the Kroger's of the world, where I can go in and just scan my groceries and it's more of a, modified but still now becoming a traditional experience or you can do this and what i don't know is all the technology hurdles that kind of go in between those spots because something will show up something new will hit right so technology is not a one-size-fits-all approach sorry um loss prevention so when you think about a situation where a customer can walk in, grab their stuff and walk out, the first knee jerk reaction is, oh dear God, they're gonna steal the entire store. They're gonna steal it all. We're gonna have $20,000 audits. So here's the good news. Um, we, we've had skip in place for quite a few months now. Um, our audit numbers are just on par as they were last year. So, so as a little statistic, which we may get some questions later, which we will definitely offer up the room to have, um, it's invisible. We don't see it. We, we wouldn't even necessarily know the difference, but I can tell you this, our loss prevention is still in check. So um, it's one of these situations to which I think the customers that really want to utilize this technology um, recognize the risk that we're taking and want to kind of show it in return and, and utilize the technology and kind of go forward with it. The other problem is, is how do you know if this works? So when you do bleeding edge stuff, you get to a situation where it's like, well, okay, well, what's a win, right? And I, and I think that is a extremely fair question to ask yourselves. And I think everybody that adopts a cutting edge technology should still ask it. So if you've got cutting edge, I don't have a NAX data set to benchmark against. So how do I know what a win is? Okay. Do, is, it, is it how many transactions a day I use or, or do? Is it um, a reduction in credit card fees? Because maybe I can process cheaper. Is it a situation where I'm just trying to figure out a way to make certain customers happy? Right? So, so it really comes down to, I, you really have to define that on your own. And, and we couldn't really figure this out ourselves. Um, at first we tried to go through the situation of, you know what, okay, we're gonna do a flat transactions per day. Okay, interesting, all right. 
And then we realized it wasn't necessarily a transactions per day that was really interesting. It was the people actually using the app more and more. So then it becomes a frequency benchmark. Okay, well, if the people use it the first time, do they increase their frequency when they're there? Hmm, yeah, that one's actually pretty good. That one's actually a more interesting benchmark than just customers per day using the platform, right? Because you can grow sales, what, two ways. You can either get more people in or get the same people buying more stuff, right? So, um, so industry benchmarks is definitely something that's challenging. And, you know, frankly, you have to be disciplined enough to know where it's at. Supporting company initiatives along with major oils. And, and this one is a, this is a tough cookie to crack because we all wanna play nice in the pond and we all wanna support our partners well. And we all wanna create a situation and an environment where everybody does right and we're great at it and we execute it to 100% level. Um, it just doesn't work like that. So navigating the waters of trying to figure out you know, hey, my major oil has a situation where they have their own app platform. Okay, all right. You know, do they do points? Do they not do points? Okay. You know, how, how do you navigate that into the message? And, and kind of going back to one of the previous slides that I made reference to earlier was, you know, I, I got to figure out how to converge all these things. And I got to figure out how to do it effectively and, and cleanly. And oh, by the way, I have to get those employees to understand it and buy into it. So, yeah. The last one that I kind of have benchmarked here is training. And this is the one that we actually failed the most on. Um, it was one of those things that seemed deceptively simple to execute. Oh man, we, uh, <laughs> we, we tripped up on this one. This was a stumbling block for us. So we created a concise message. Okay, check. We figured out what we're wanting to do, okay, check. We figured out a way where we think we can navigate the major oil waters and make everybody happy, check. Okay, we, we went out there and we threw the solution out there and we said, okay, CSRs, here's how we do this. And then we didn't follow up with them for about 45 days. And so when we queue them up and we ask them questions, we're like, hey, how come, you know, and, and you know, kind of disclosing some information specific to cruisers, we have stores that have just, lack of a better term, crushed it. They've done extremely well with it. They've adopted it. They've got customers onboarding literally every day. It's doing well. And then we have some stores that literally do zero transactions a day. And so what do I do? I get in my little car and I drive to that store and I say, hey, why, why isn't anybody using Skip? What, what's wrong? Well, we don't know how to use it. What? One hour worth of training wasn't enough to do this? You, well, come on now. So, so there was the initial rollout. Okay, all right. But then there was this continued education approach and that's the breakdown because then we were hiring new CSRs and the new CSRs didn't know. And so we got into our little bit of a struggle spot because then we had to redo all the training again because it was really unsure when the ops guys and I were all talking, it was like, okay guys, so do we really need to start all over and do the training all over again? They said, yes, I said, okay. So what did we do? We got the ghost skip team back out. We kind of did another training and all that. The training section of this is one of the other points too that I just really want to pound home. Create the game plan first. Create the game plan in a way where you're actually going to follow up on your training. Um, I don't, I mean, if you have a CBT solution, great, fantastic. Take 20 minutes and do it. Um, if you have a situation where you've got a corporate training program, do it. We, we did not, and it cost us time and it cost us growth. Um, and so that's where we, we kind of tripped on that. Um, at this point, I have intentionally left 10 minutes early because I had a feeling that there was gonna be some questions in the room. So if anybody would like to ask questions, there is a microphone right here. I would really like to see some questions. If not, we have some questions because Steven was smart and ahead of the game and he said, hey, we need to prime the pump a little bit. I said, okay. So go ahead, Tim. Uh, congratulations on what yeah. you've done here. Thanks. I was wondering, um, so right now having Skip is your differentiation. Your competition mm -hmm. doesn't have it. Yeah. What about down the road? If your competition would to adopt Skip, how will you differentiate yeah. or is there an opportunity to differentiate? Yeah, so, so again, just, just in case somebody didn't hear, he was asking, um, what do we do when our competitors adopt similar technologies, right? Um, 
so this really does come to the branding experience. And I think where this gets interesting is when a lot of people have conversations about building the experience, a lot of the times that has to deal with the repetition and visits, okay? And so I think where we win is if we're first to market, we talk about it, we get vocal about it, we brag about it, we get happy about it, and then all of a sudden we get the behavior to where people are constantly visiting us, utilizing that technology, I think that's where we win. So are we scared of competitors coming in next door having the same technology? No, hopefully where our competitive advantage was or our unique selling proposition was, we were the first to market and we've kind of gotten all that technology and people have adopted it and then we've got the repetition built in and we've built some loyalty there. So that's kind of how we would deal with it. Any other questions? Yeah, please. So have you seen same store sales growth on that basis? No. Okay, not yet. No. I was waiting for somebody to ask that question. Yeah, again, there's, there's the candid part of this, right? No, have, sales, have same, same, still, or same store sales increased? No. What's really great is, is the customers that use it love it. But again, this goes back to the no benchmarks. I, I, don't, I don't even really know if that's success. And, and even conversely, right? So let's spin this the other way around. Well, if, if sales aren't up or if sales are down, okay, well, is it because we're trying to do a technology shift or something like this? I, you know, again, where I could try to make the argument for, I could also sit back and play the devil's advocate and go against too, so. Any other questions? Oh, Tim's got another one, he's coming after me. No, sorry, this is <laughs> just very interesting. Sure. Um, it, it, in retail, it's, it's tough enough to get a, a customer just to get one app onto yep. their phone. Now you're in a situation where you got a major oil app and a go skip app. Is there anything that you have to do extra to get the, the two apps onto a customer's phone? Oh, thank you for asking a great question. So I think this is a need for technologies and owners of their application platforms to really be open with themselves and us to say, we need more API integration. Um, some of these systems that these providers put out there, they're closed and they're, they're single loop and they have their own feedback loop and they kind of keep their own ecosystem going. But what we really need to do, again, this goes back to the Connexus argument. It's the standards adoption. Open up the platform, let's integrate these things, and let's get all a single pane of glass. Let's work into a situation where we can utilize all these technologies on the back end, but still only present a single platform to the consumer. So, any other questions? Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you guys some benchmarks and then I'm gonna say, we're gonna move on. So one of the questions that was asked was same store sales, the answer was no. Have we seen a significant bump in any data metric? No, okay. Um, have we seen employee buy-in excited about it? Sort of, and, and the interesting thing here, and I'm gonna flip back on the slide here real quick here is going back to that first bullet point, notice how I put customer slash employee because the irony is, is our, our CSRs represent our customers too, right? They, they're, they're kind of cut from the same cloth. So um, they were like, oh, Nick, they're, they're not gonna do this. Okay, well, what can we do to figure out a way? So, um, yeah, anyway. So we have no great bullet points here. We've got great stickiness. It, it is what the uh, go skip, so they preach 81%. We're even above that. Um, sales, you know, I kind of was honest about that. Transactions, they're growing every day. So, um, but again, we're still trying to figure out if we like this or not. So, any other questions? All right, well, just to give everybody a little heads up, you're gonna receive a short survey about this. And uh, if you complete the survey, you know, we'll uh, love to get your feedback and listen to what you guys have to say about it. Thanks everybody. Mm -hmm.